Well, hello, and welcome to uh, BA377. Uh, yeah, not optimal conditions for the first day of class, but uh, we'll, we'll work around it. Um, what we're going to do is I'm just going to summarize um, the material for this week and kind of give you a heads up in terms of the syllabus, some of the other items. And uh, we'll talk about some of the material, or I'll talk about some of the material. And then next week, if you have any questions and, and when we have more time, uh, we'll follow up. My apologies, this wasn't the way it was supposed to happen. wasn't supposed to be on this trip. Uh, in fact, I am currently in Portland Airport. So if you hear some background noise, we'll, we'll just try and ignore it and work with it. But I figured it's better to uh, get this uh, um, recorded and, and put out there um, this week. I will actually be coming back Thursday night, but obviously late Thursday night. So um, I don't anticipate any other problems like this for the rest of the term. So don't don't worry about that um a little bit about me i did uh about 23 years in the air force and uh have a couple daughters um obviously a lot of animals too um most of my experience i was a did a lot of flying um i was a f4 uh, that's me in the back seat of that one um g models and then also uh strike eagles f 15 es um we just Whatever, there's always things going on um, at our home. This foal there on the left, she's actually a little filly. She's about four months old now. She was born. She was that big red horse, and the my older daughter's leaning against red. That's her her daughter, and then Chiefy's in the back with my other daughter. So, anyway, um, most of my stuff though for how well, like I said, I did 23 years, and the first eight, 10 years was flying, and the rest of it was all. Um, doing more, you know, logistics and and uh, strategic, strategic communications type uh, tasks for the second half. And I did uh, stay in Europe for oh, probably 12 to 14 years out of that period. So um, we'll touch on some of that, but um, a lot of the logistics type stuff that I'll I'll talk about uh, was derived from that. I also work as a uh, consultant for a, a large consultant firm, Booz Allen Hamilton, and uh, um, so again, that touches on some of the aspects. Um, in terms of the syllabus itself, there's going to be two exams and then the final, so I guess three total there. The two midterms, 20% on homework. The homework will be turned in. If you look on the syllabus, I think it's fairly well explained, but it'll be turned in. Um, prior to the test and typically uh, students will do like in a in a uh, some sort of notebook whatever type of folder and uh, you'll hand it in the uh, the night of the test I'll return it to you the next week and then at the final obviously you'll turn it in for the last time but we can talk more about those if you have any questions <clears throat> attendance is is 10% as well so um, you know between the homework and the attendance uh, there's 30 points that are definitely available to you, um, so 30 out of 30 is, is well within your reach for that segment of the class. In terms of attendance, um, you're allowed to miss, miss a class um, unless you have some sort of prior coordination. So best coordination, well really the only coordination that really works is, is via email. So, you know, I don't mind people saying, oh, I'm going to miss class, whatever. But uh, when it comes to doing the grades at the end, it's it's very helpful to have it on email. So make sure you just follow up with a with an email, and that way there won't be any confusion. Especially uh, you know the spring term, everybody goes every which way come finals time, and that's when I'm doing the uh, doing the actual grades. So it's it's better for me to uh, have a solid record. But anyway, not a not a big deal. Um, operations management. Most of you folks are at least familiar with the term, but anyway, it's the you know, well, the production part is creation of goods and services, and then the operation management of the activities that you know do the transformation, the inputs and the outputs. So, uh, in terms of testing and all that, I'll have a pretty thorough review before um, each exam. You'll also find the uh, the notes like these. Um, they'll be posted in the material section. So these slides here that I'm going through tonight uh, will be on the. Uh, <clears throat> on Blackboard, excuse me, and uh, you'll be able to go through it, but 
big picture, I, I don't go so much for for lists and dates and names. We will talk about some of that tonight in this section. And that's why, you know, again, this is less than optimum to not be there for the first, first course. But um, things like this, um, you know, a list like this, we, we won't uh, be hitting that so much on the test. You will be able to, you know, pick most of these out without any problem just by uh, uh, what we'll cover in the, in the uh, course. But uh, uh, don't worry about, you know, jotting these ones necessarily down. Um, there are some video clips that go along with the course. And we will spend some time next week and, and uh, show, those, show those video clips. Um, I may try and attach them to the uh, file tonight and uh, um, just for background. But again, we'll talk about them next week. The uh, video clips, there's different companies and free to lay. Um, in in this aspect, um, in terms of operation management, they are pretty efficient. They've got you know a pretty difficult task trying to get a product from uh, from uh, the. Uh, sorry about this announcement, but anyway, their product gets from the field to the market uh, typically in three days. So that's going to present some serious serious challenges for uh, uh, operations management. So anyway, uh, we'll, we'll look more at that as we go. Chapter one is gonna be uh, operations and productivity. Again, another list, um, when you are a manager, you obviously will, will inherently do these. Will you use the same, same uh, terminology and the same order? Not necessarily, so again, um, that is though what, what managers do. So. We will be talking about both goods and services, so you know how to differentiate the two. Obviously, one's a product and one's a, a service being delivered. Again, um, some of this is just background to make sure we have a, a common baseline. We will be talking about quality, though, and quality as defined, you know, as, as you should define it as, a, as an operations manager, isn't, isn't in the traditional um, sense it's it's in the macro <clears throat> enterprise level when we're talking about quality we're talking about um you know the the bigger scheme how how an operation is 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 run to ultimately deliver you know value to the uh, to the end user so it's not uh, necessarily you know what you're thinking about in terms of the most expensive product or something like that i mean again that um the best product usually is a result of quality practices, but we're talking about the, the quality process and not just uh, attributes of a specific product. So we'll talk more about that as, as we go along. You'll be pretty well versed in quality by the end of the, uh, end of the uh, subject. And who's responsible for quality? Obviously everybody. Um, process and design capacity. You know, you can come up with the greatest idea in the world with a product that's in, you know, the consumer um, has, has been asking for. But if you can't produce it, um, you've got some real trouble. And most consumer products, they follow a, follow a, a certain curve where there's going to be a, a huge uh, ramp up and then a decline. And uh, you have to make sure that your processes are in place to deliver the capacity um, that's uh, you know, requested during that short uh, window that's available. It would make more sense if you look at, you know, a product. Let's say it's a, you know, an iPhone. Uh, an iPhone 4 is, you know, not saleable right now. Obviously, they moved on. And so that window for like an iPhone 5, again, that, that's a, you know, definite limits on that. Um, most of the better companies will have new products in place routinely. Uh, companies like 3M actually have it as part of their, their mission where they want a certain percentage, like 30, 40% of the products out there being new products, you know, products being developed in the last couple of years. Again, it'll de depend on your segment and industry, but um, anyway, that's, that's why capacity is important. Location strategy. Um, this really depends on what, what we're talking about in terms of a, uh, uh, whether it's a good or a service. Um, 
obviously if you're doing manufacturing type things, producing goods, um, it's all about cost and, and managing that. But if you're delivering a service and you're uh, you know, looking for, for revenue from customers, well then the location is, is uh, premium and you're willing to pay more in terms of expenses and you aren't nearly as concerned with cost control. Layout strategy, again, we'll just tap on this. This has to do with the internal layout. This is kind of um, manufacturing focused where, you know, how the facility is actually laid out to be most efficient. And then human resources. Human resources is probably the most complex topic we'll talk about because it's incredibly uh, difficult to, you know, do it do it properly because there's so many variables. Um, if, if all you were doing in, in a manufacturing sense was just putting out product, uh, it would be quite easy. But anybody who's you know been involved in any sort of manufacturing, or for that matter, especially restaurants and other things that are very uh, labor intensive, that can be a, a huge, huge challenge. Supply chain management. You have different options in terms of how you're going to arrange that and we'll discuss that. Inventory, uh, materials requirement, and just in time. Um, again, just in time flows you know, directly from, from quality. And you need to be able, a, a, a modern, efficient company needs to be able to incorporate just in time because they need to be responsive to their, to their customer. And so uh, if you're gonna have a product that's continuously improving, you need to have a very agile um, supply chain and design uh, mechanism in place so that uh, your product can be kept up to date. Intermediate short-term scheduling, again, we'll talk about how, how scheduling factors into it and then maintenance. Um, maintenance really has to do with making sure that the equipment, um, whatever it's doing, whatever function it's performing, is is ready to go it can deliver the capacity that you're you're requesting of it and the only way that's possible is if it's if it's well maintained different things in in uh, operations management again we aren't going to have these uh, these you know time frames this isn't a, a history course but what has happened big picture is that there's a lot of concepts and and operations management they'll talk about and say you know, oh, you know, they've evolved and, and management is so superior than how, really it has to do more with technology. Uh, there have always been smart people around, but they didn't have the, the tools to enable what they wanted to do. So things like continuous improvement where you can design something on a computer and make changes quickly and, and efficiently, um, you know, folks would have had that back when they're building Model Ts, they, they definitely would have incorporated, but that sort of stuff wasn't available. Another thing that you'll see, and especially if you do any study of quality, um, the, they'll very much highlight the fact that, uh, you know, uh, Toyota and, and a lot of the Japanese manufacturers really implemented quality um, first, but the thing is that uh, the ideas that they were using came largely uh, from the from the U.S. and and you know call it what you want, but um, the big three back in the day, you know, in the '60s and '70s, just weren't uh, putting out a quality product. They weren't being responsive to the customer, and uh, that really um, gave a, an advantage to the Japanese manufacturers at the time to uh, get a. A chunk of that market and they've really never looked back so um, the ideas themselves um, probably did not flow from Asian uh, practices but um, the implementation they were some of the first to to implement them um, again you know things have changed um, and there's been a lot of folks to to contribute to this but uh, things we take for granted um, you know, some of these interchangeable parts, standardized parts, that just wasn't the case. And it, it happened first probably in, in, you know, weapons, guns, pistols, things like that, where 
you know, initially these things were one-off designs, and if something broke, uh, you had to have another custom-made part. The, the concept that you could switch parts between, uh, you know, guns in this case, um, that was completely foreign, so that was a huge step forward. And then there's been other changes as, as they've come along. Probably the most significant person on here, and again, you know, we aren't going to be testing on names, but Deming there in 1950, he was really the one who, uh, uh, you know, wrote some of the initial books on, uh, you know, really um, defining quality, and they were the ones that were adapted by, uh, by the Japanese, primarily in auto manufacturing. Um, new challenges? You know, obviously they always want to say everything's dramatic. Oh, things are completely different now. Again, it's an evolution. But um, that evolution, with the advent of computers, the internet, and the rest of that, it really has, has accelerated. And so, you know, for example, mass customization over there uh, on the bottom, that was something that you could not do uh, cheaply and efficiently. Now with a computer, and you know internet type ordering and a customer being able to specify exactly what they want and, and lean and agile logistics supply chains you can do that it's not hard to do you know um, computer aided design computer aided manufacturing or just automated manufacturing in general does not have a problem with with you know unique um, uh, items that can be customized specifically to a, to an end user so that's good um, again, we're going to talk about goods and services. So, obviously, you can you can define the two. Uh, not too difficult. Goods, obviously, are tangible things that you can you can touch. Can be inventory too, and the ability to inventory them is is critical. You're going to find that inventory is really a it's kind of the enemy because when you put something in the inventory, obviously it, it can't be improved. Um, you're also probably financed it, um, so you're wasting money there. You're storing it. You've got obsolescence. Somebody can steal it in the, in the process. Anyway, you see companies like, say, Circuit City, for example. What was their primary downfall? Inventory. You know, it's a tough world out there. And, and for them to have a brick-and-mortar electronic store is, is very, very difficult. You know, even, even Best Buy, a lot of times they just function as kind of a a showroom where people go in there, look at products, and then maybe order them elsewhere. At least on the smaller stuff. Obviously, uh, you know, big screens, not so much. Services, intangible, um, high customer interaction, and often knowledge base. The best way to think about this is, is maybe getting a haircut. Um, there's certain things about a haircut that, regardless, um, are not going to change. You know, you can't inventory haircuts. They're certainly intangible, um, you know, and there's huge customer interaction. What I think is a good haircut, you guys will see. I'm not going to put up the video now, but you'll go, wow, that's horrible. So, anyway, um, it, it definitely you want to be involved with the uh, with the customer. Um, again, no shock that uh, manufacturing has moved to lower wage um, countries. There is a small chance um, with more automation that some aspects will, will come back. But again, our corporate tax structure is pretty much one of the highest in the industrial world. So not a lot of incentives, but uh, we will see. Um, manufacturing employment. You can see that the services are, you know, manufacturing, what, what employment uh, remains uh, as it automates, productivity goes up, and so fewer people are required. So services are, are definitely where uh, the numbers are in terms of growth. Are they the best jobs, the highest paying jobs? No, not necessarily. But a lot of the manufacturing jobs were, you know, the, the guys working on the assembly lines doing some tedious work, that, that wasn't necessarily the best work either, so. Um, Again, industrial production and manufacturing employment. Just look at the overall trends. The basic thing is that, you know, employment is is 
uh, going down or held steady while the production is taking off. And again, that has to do with a lot more automation. Continuing challenges. Um, again, uh, these are accurate, but uh, you know, in terms of ethics and regulations, not at the forefront. Um, at least publicly, these these things are are much more visible. Have they made huge changes? Maybe, maybe not. On some things they have, but certainly the emphasis to publicize any and all, um, you know, the things that are done in the public spirit, um, that that's something that you know you, you see over and over again. And and when they make changes to a product, if at all, they can tie it to um, some sort of Oh, green development or whatever, they, they definitely will. And there we go again with uh, environmental and some of the ISO standards. ISO is, uh, it has to do with, again, quality standards that companies will subscribe to and they'll be ISO rated. We'll talk more about that, but uh, sometimes they, they, they actually have some baggage in terms of some inherent protectionism. Um, some of the ISOs that were employed in Europe were basically to keep some of the other other uh, manufacturers out. So, environmentally sensitive production, green manufacturing. It's true, but um, again, sometimes you have to be able to sort out the uh, the PR aspects from the actual changes. You know, for example, if if they're going to build the new, let's say the new Chevy truck's going to be lighter because they're going to be built with more plastic. And it's going to have you know thinner doors because steel's getting expensive. Are they going to say, yeah, we're we're trying to lighten it up because it's getting too expensive, or are they going to say, well, in the spirit of green manufacturing, you know, we reduced rate right to lower the, you know, it's it's just spin in marketing. So um, I, again, I, I don't mean to be um, you know so cynical and pessimistic, but um, sometimes you have to look and see what the what the processes are and whether things have actually changed. Empowered employees, that is part of quality. A lot of times you will find some of the best ideas and some of the sharpest, you know, projects will, will flow directly from the workers who have been out there on the line. So they definitely aren't to be um, ignored. Um, supply chain, we'll talk about that uh, to a great extent, just as just in time, just in time uh, performance, just in time. Um, delivery methods so again they've labeled out the uh, the new trends I don't see anything definitely new in there it's just different emphasis on different items productivity <clears throat> productivity is the uh, just the ratio of, of uh, goods and services based upon outputs and inputs so again, um, we will talk a little about productivity. In fact, there'll, there'll be a question on one of the tests and you know, basically say you know, which one of these is an increase in productivity. And you know, it basically means either producing um, more with the same inputs or producing um, you know, um, greater amounts um, with, with, with lesser inputs. So, Again, we'll, we'll look at examples in class, but it's, it's something that's, that's uh, definitely been improving due to uh, technology and the use of uh, more uh, sophisticated uh, manufacturing machinery. Again, just big picture, not an economics class, but uh, you know, transforming uh, inputs. Now some of these things too, you know, here they're looking at productivity. Some of these things that, that don't affect the customers um, and improve productivity, that's that's huge, you know. If, if they can stop requiring signatures on credit card purchases, you know, which they've done for 25 and now sometimes it's $50, that is a win-win. You know, the customer does benefit from that. But if they start, you know, changing things in terms of, of something that's perceptible to the to the customer that kind of degrades from his Starbucks experience then that uh, 
that is a negative aspect and, and something that you would probably want to uh, resist the temptation. I mean, let's face it, people aren't going to Starbucks to pay five bucks for a, a cup of coffee to be brushed through the process. So, again, you have to look at the, the you know, standpoint from the, from the end user. And that's, in essence, what quality is. It's always focused on the, on the customer and is there value added um, by the process that's being performed. And on some of these, you know, mega chains, small changes can, you know, result in, in huge dollar figures. Again, how you do, you know, productivity. So, let's say you're producing, you know, manhole covers at a factory and, and you produce, you know, 25 manholes covers, you know, those big steel discs with, uh, with 20 hours. Um, you would divide those two numbers and that would give you your productivity. So if you're able to produce that same number of manhole covers with, with 15 hours, obviously that's an increase in productivity. So productivity calculations, again, we just ran through one of those. Multi-factor productivity, yeah, there's you know, labor, material, energy, capital, resources. You, you could add in more factors on here, but it's, it's, it's going to make the problem a, a little bit more complex, but obviously a little bit more, more accurate. Again, you know, some of the external elements can change things up. It's kind of hard to uh, describe this without you know, being able to draw on the board in class, but we will follow up on those items. Productivity variables. So, again, they're assigning different, um, you know, percentages for the for the increase in productivity. It's not by chance that they say, yeah, superior management has brought about 52% of that annual increase. Seems a bit high. Um, Really, a lot of this has to do with, with the, the technology, the manufacturing processes that have changed. So if they want to attribute that to manufacturing, them, they could, but it, it has to do with uh, automation and, and items like that. So key variables, yeah, again, good workers, um, you know, are, are good to go. I spent quite a few years in Turkey and, and you know, a lot of the folks who work for us were getting paid about seven bucks a day, and uh, sometimes you know, they could have been overpaid because they just weren't able to deliver what was needed. It wasn't that they were bad people, but they just didn't have the the aptitude or, or the skills or the education to to get it done. So the, the grass isn't always greener. Just because somebody will work for a, a small wage doesn't mean that um, you know the value is there necessarily. And again, getting back to services, the difference, obviously, you know, services are going to be labor intensive typically, uh, difficult to mechanize. Nobody wants their, you know, haircut by some machine. And the quality part, the difficult to evaluate for quality is, is true because it's, it's based upon um, your personal desires. So it's, it's hard to standardize what is good and what is bad. Um, they're trying to show, you know, how productivity in a service type thing like Taco Bell a restaurant can be changed. So again, Taco Bell just knew due to the numbers, you know, in the franchise, um, you can really spend a lot of time you can afford to to really analyze the process because any savings found are going to be multiplied by uh, such a high number that it's well worth your time. So here they do some, you know, simple things. Just eight seconds of preparation, preparation time is going to be multiplied by, you know, so many times that operation's done per day per restaurant, and the numbers are going to really add up. Ethics and social responsibility. Again, you know, um, companies are are doing better, but 
obviously not everything's perfect and, and companies previously where they weren't necessarily out to provide a dangerous workplace or you know dirty the environment so again I think they're kind of building up a straw man here uh, one of the things though that has changed is especially with the internet uh, there were some practices that were done overseas um, by US companies or, or multinationals or whatever that were um, probably not something they would be proud of and because of the you know better communications and again it's you know cliche here but the internet and everything else uh, you, you just simply can't operate like that um, the company for example Union Carbide years ago had a big uh, plant in uh, Bhopal India and we're talking probably 30 years ago now but they were building or making pesticides there not good practices um, huge accident and a lot of folks died and uh, it was very bad for the company then uh, not to say that the poor folks involved but anyway um, that would certainly put them out of business if they were to do something uh, that foolish again in, in this time frame as it was I don't think Union Carbide ever really recovered and they've always been kind of stained with that image of from, from the deaths in Bhopal all right, I'm going to uh, stop for just a second. That was uh, the first chapter, and we'll be uh, be right back.